when we first, as a committee, started talking about subjects that we might, I might speak on, we thought of this one, and I thought, fantastic, it's great. And as I have looked at it more and more, I was thinking, what were we thinking, seriously? The fruit of the Spirit in itself, in Galatians 5, we could just do one session on love, one session on joy. However, we have two sessions today, and we're going to try and jam it all in together and see where we end up. Oops, might help if I turn it around the right way. Am I going to go the way? Oh, sorry, power. Yeah? It worked last night, seriously. You wrote about this. <laughs> okay. Jess will do it. All right, first slide, Jess. I like to think of myself as a gardener. But when I look at my overgrown tomatoes and my convolvulus and my weeds, I'm thinking perhaps not. But I can't, I do an all right job with my roses. That's my garden up there, a very small snapshot of my garden. And I can do a fine line in herbs and salads. Next one. But I'm not the garden my mother was. Now, this is the only shot I could find of my mother's garden. Back then, you didn't take photos willy-nilly because you had to print them. So that's me at the age of nine, off to school. And these are her prize-winning dahlias. She used to enter into the A&P show. I don't know if you have it down here, but... Um, and she would win prizes for her dahlias. My father was a fruit and veg man. He had an amazing garden. He had... Um, all sorts of, of vegetables, we would eat. We never bought vegetables, people didn't do it back then, but we ate all the produce from his garden, except he did grow this horrible f vegetable called choco, and it was kind of this marrow, prickly marrow thing that mum would boil to death, and it was the most disgusting thing. <laughs> but his peaches, plums, grapes, grapefruit, I can just sit here and I, just, I can just see his garden, he was amazing. And I'd hoped that I would inherit that gardening gene, but I didn't have a chance, I'm adopted, no way. <laughs> but along the way, I have found a few secrets to gardening. And the first one is frequent watering. It's apparently a life and death thing for plants. Who knew? I was away for a month recently on holiday, and I did give detailed instructions to my children about feeding the pets, and watering the plants, my pot plants that I had left inside the bath. So I'd hope that they would see it if they occasionally had a shower. But I forgot the pot plant at the front door, and unfortunately, although they walked past that every day, <laughs> it didn't get any water. So I came back and everything's looking going, Ugh. And the next thing that I've noticed is that they thrive on regular feeding. Apparently, I didn't know that either, and for a while, and then I sort of have these little, little tiny little flowers, but if you feed them occasionally, they actually grow beautifully. Weeding. Pick them out when they're small. I didn't know that, because by the time I get to my weeds, you know, they're like this. I'm usually on the phone to my father, because it's a, a one-hour job, so I wander around with my phone, picking out weeds, and then I'm going, oh, hang on a sec, Dad, <laughs> just got to pull out another weed. The other thing that I found is companion planting, is when plants and flowers are planted together, they will grow better, especially in salads and tomatoes and things like that. They grow better, the bugs don't get to onto that plant because they're busy on this plant. And then we have pruning. Careful and judicious lopping off of branches produces bigger apples, more grapes, more tomatoes apparently rather than letting them go <laughs> like this. But we're not here today to talk about a gardening lesson. We, because you probably wouldn't learn very much from me, but we're to talk about the fruit of righteousness and how do we grow that. Well, we can't grow them without being planted first. And vines can't bear grapes if they aren't planted or grafted onto a, a, a vine. And so we're going to talk about how God plants the seed of faith in us. 
Now, God is the most loving ruler of the world. He made the world. He made us, he made us as people. He made two, a man and a woman, and he put them in a garden. I would actually love to see that garden. Don't you? It would be amazing. Next one, Jess. And so he made us all rulers. He rules the world, and he made us rulers of that world under his authority. Next one. But the first people and us, we all reject God as ruler. We want to be our own little rulers. But we don't, we can't even rule ourselves. We don't rule us. We don't rule society, and we don't rule the world. Next one. We, God won't let us rebel forever. He's told us that his punishment for our rebellion is death and judgment. There is nothing we can do to make ourselves right again with God. But because of his love, God sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, now, Jesus always lived perfectly under God's authority. And so he died for us. He took the punishment of our death on himself and brought forgiveness so that we could walk with God, so that we could have a relationship with God. And then God raised Jesus again from the dead, and he became ruler of the world. Well, he is ruler of the world, and he conquered death and now he gives new life and will return to judge. So we all have two ways we can live. Next one, Jess. Oh, so there's Jesus as ruler of the world. Next one. We can choose to be our own little rulers. We can reject God and we can try to run our own life. But the result is that, the, is that we are condemned by God. He has judged us and we... Will, uh, condemned by God, and we can face death. We will face death and judgment. Or we can choose God's new way. We can submit to Jesus as our ruler, and we can rely on Jesus' death and resurrection. So the result is that we're forgiven by God, and we're given life eternal, so that we live forever. So now you have to ask yourself, which way do I want to live? Now, for most of us, we have made Jesus our ruler. We have already decided that this is the way we want to live. But some of you may not have made that, um, have thought about it like that. So I want you to think about it. Who are you going to, or which way do you want to live, and who's going to be your ruler? When God is our ruler and king, that's the starting point. That's the starting point of our life that we're going to live forever. So what now? Where do we go from here? In Hebrews chapter 5, so if you want to turn to your, um, in your pew Bibles, um, it is on page, if I can get to the right tab, page 1190. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 15, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You, will need, you need milk, not solid food. For anyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So God's calling us here to move from milk, from move from the really basic doctrines from when you were first came to the Lord to moving on to learning more and more about him. And that's what we're going to be talking today. We're talking about moving from that first state into maturity, to become mature plants, to become mature trees, to be living in that vine of Christ that Juanita read about. In chapter 6, verse 1 of Hebrews, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, but going on 
to learning more about him. We have an amazing God, absolutely amazing. He is infinite. He is so loving, kind, and good. And there is so much to learn about him. And yet often we puddle around in the, in the basic stuff. But let's move on to, that, on to loving him. In John chapter 15, so we'll flip back over to there because that's where Juanita read from. In John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus is talking here and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So we can do nothing to save ourselves. We can do nothing to have a relationship with Christ. It is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, in verse 8, it says, God is glorified. When we start to bear the fruit that God produces in us, he's glorified. Other people will see that you love the Lord. Other people will see that you are kind and gentle and faithful. They, other people see that and they're drawn to Christ because they see him in you. Where have I found Philippians? In Philippians 3, verse 12 and 13, uh, 14. Paul here is writing about how he is pressing on in Jesus. He says, Not that I have already obtained this, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ Jesus has made me his own. He wants to be more and more like Jesus Christ. He wants to be more and more his slave, his servant. He calls himself, in the beginning of most of his lessons, lesson, letters, he says, I, Paul, a slave or a bond servant or a, um, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he is bound to Christ. And he wants to, he is doing this because Christ has made him his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who are mature think this way. So we, as we mature, we want to be looking up towards that reward that we're going to receive of eternal life and to spending time with God forever. Sometimes, sadly, people get stuck spiritually. They go, well, I'm over the mark. I'm all good. I don't have to do any more because I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm all good. Or that... I am. I give to the church on a regular basis and rock up to sun, church on Sunday, twice. That's that's all I need to do. They want to do good, or they do good, and they think that's enough. But what happens is, our fruit is small. People often don't see it. That's a, actually an apple off my tree rather embarrassingly, because I didn't prune it and I didn't feed it. I did water it occasionally. So that's what I've produced, is a little apple. And the fruit of righteousness we bear is little if we are not abiding in Christ, if we're not spending time with him. So as I listed some of those things before, let's look at how our gardening lesson is going to reflect our walk with Christ. Now the first one is, frequent watering. Jesus said, I am the living water. Whoever drinks of me will never thirst. And the water is usually associated in the Bible with or this water, um, receiving the means of grace, preaching of God's word, uh, the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper, and prayer. When we listen to sermons, God is feeding us. We are, um, and watering us with his word. We are hearing what God is saying to us. 
we can actively listen. There's a book, I think it's listed in your, um, in your programs, called What is a Healthy Member? A church member, and Tabiti Anambwele uh, in there writes how listening to sermons actively is a part of who, how we can abide in Christ, how we can hear God speaking to us. As we come to Lord's Supper, we're joining with others and remembering what Christ does for, has done for us. Sometimes we can just go through the motions. We come up here, we have a a bit of bread, we have a drink, and everything's all very embarrassing because where do you look? And then you go back and sit down. But actually, as we come together in the Lord's Supper, we're remembering the huge sacrifice that God has sent, how he sent his son to die for us. That's huge. How he came as a, as a human baby from being the king of glory, and he's come down to earth as a fleshy body, and he is died and to save us. That is huge, and we're encouraged by that. We're strengthened by that. And as we come together and see baptisms, that is so encouraging to see that God's of God's goodness and his blessing to us. Now, when you're praying, it is encouraging. When you spend time in prayer with the Lord, in any relationship, you've got to talk, whether it's to your husband, and you've got to let him talk back, by the way. This is, that's a conversation. You don't do all the talking. And, it's a, and, and this is a conversation we have with Jesus. We talk to Jesus. We can do it regularly. We can do it all the time. You can do it when you're changing the nappy, cleaning the toilet, serving customers in a shop, doing English jobs for the boss, polishing the silver, or driving the mum taxi, although I don't suggest you close your eyes when you're driving the mum taxi, or actually when you're changing the nappy, that's not so good either. <laughs> or my favourite, when I'm lying awake and I cannot get to sleep, just praying, spending time praying the Lord to the Lord. Um, I know the committee has worked really hard this last little while, and I know I have been carried by their prayers. We've carried each other by their prayers. We've been carried by your prayers for us. And we've known that. It's given us such peace and such rest. I, um, I was talking to Sarah, who's had a terrible cold, and we both slept really well last night. And that has not happened before that for a while. It's just a lovely sense of peace when you're praying with God to God at night. It's like someone described it as falling asleep in your father's arms. And as you fall asleep, because you're praying, it is just a gentle um, reminder of, of how, how ever, Heavenly Father loves us. And that simple act of praying, it changes us, it invigorates us, and it encourages us. And then there are times of deep watering, family camp, church camp, where you're spending time together with a smaller community of God, well, family camp was actually 100 and something people, but you're getting fed you have sessions, morning and afternoon tea, um, morning and afternoon. You have, yeah, the afternoon tea is usually pretty good too. Um, you, ha <laughs> um, you get uh, time of fellowship, talking about the studies and groups, but also t other times of deep fellowship, talking to people you haven't <coughs> talked to for a while or you haven't even met before, and you get to know them on a, such a deep and rich um, place. Another time I found it was I went to a trip uh, from Hastings up to Auckland to a conference to listen to this guy, Tabiti Anambule, who wrote that book I talked about. And it's, we couldn't afford an aeroplane from Hastings to Auckland, way too expensive, so I caught a $1 naked bus trip, nine hours from Hastings to Auckland and back again, and a weekend at this conference. I had loaded up my iPad with... Uh, sermons and talks and podcasts, and I listen to them all the way up. I listen to them all the way back, and I had this amazing speaker during the week, a weekend. I came back, it was only like Friday to um, Monday morning, I came back and I was walking about this far off the ground. And when I saw people the next Sunday, they'd say, oh, how was your weekend? Oh, wow, 
Can I tell you about my weekend? Can I tell you about how God is so amazing? It was a just, I felt like so full of God. I'd been totally saturated by God. And if you ever have an opportunity to just spend time with God, it is amazing. He just fills you up with his love and his goodness and his kindness Now, regular feeding. This is studying God's word. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of God dwell in you richly. So we need to read it. Now, I know that some of you are really busy. You've got little kids, and life is just crazy nuts. I have seven children. I know what it's like. But you can just use the time that you do have read the Bible. It might be one verse at a time. Um, It might be that you can just, that's all you can cope with. Just seize whatever moment you can grab hold of and read your Bible. And study it. Uh, You can study it on your own. You can get all the commentaries out and have it. This is what my mum used to do. She'd lead a Bible study every year for Uh, every week for over 40 years. And every morning I would get up and her, the kitchen table was covered with um, her Bible, her notebooks, and all these commentaries. It's just a beautiful example to me of how you can study the Bible and and do it on your own. You can um, study it one-on-one. Get together with one other person. Say, look, let's meet for an hour and just go through a small passage of... um, the Bible at a time. You can do it in a Bible study, and I would encourage you to get together with others and study the Bible. Even if your lives are really chaotic, you can find time to read the Bible. I mean, our phones are amazing. If you get um, the software, you can. Uh, uh, my English Standard Version Bible on my iPad comes with a daily devotional. So if I click it on, and I can, it comes up with something, a verse that I can think about for the day. And it also comes up with another reading. And you know, when you're working hard or you've got a full family life, reading through the Bible in a year, yeah, it's not going to happen. So just, it doesn't matter. You don't have to read the Bible in a year. They are, it's great to do that. It gives you a great overview of the whole Bible. But sometimes in our lives, we don't have time for that. So just focus on small chunks. I met with a lady for um, over a year. She was a locum doctor, and we went through the Lord's Prayer, phrase by phrase, each week. So the first week, we did Our Father. And we thought about, what does Our Father mean? We looked, we studied in the Bible the other references to our Father, and we meditated and thought about it, and then we came back the next week, and we talked about what that had meant to us, and then we went on to the next, fa- next phrase, who art in heaven. Um, and then we talked about the heavenly Father, and what that meant, and then we went on to the next one, we did the whole Lord's Prayer like that. I just felt like I knew my heavenly Father, I knew where, what he wanted to give for us, do for us, provide for us to forgive our sins as we forgive those who forgive others. He's a wonderful God, and it was a wonderful time of refreshing. You can do that with the Lord's um, uh, Psalm 23. Some of these really basic psalms that we know so, so well. The Lord is my shepherd. Or you can even break it down to the Lord, the Lord, my Lord, the Lord of the world. And think about what does that mean? And the Lord is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. He's the one that guides me. You can think about how that's going to um, impact your life and study that. And and that's what's called meditating. It's just thinking about those um, passages. You can memorise scripture with your children. I'd have done that. My kids, we come up every now and again with a passage we've all memorised together. It's actually really good for me more than probably for them because they can do it in about five minutes and I'm still struggling at the next week trying to get to that verse. Read theologically good books. 
add, try and get through some good books. There are some good books talked about today. That Respectable Sins is really good. There's a, a list of books in your booklets of, of good books to read. Um, I remember when I had little kids reading either Schaefer's Art of the Homemaking, it's got pictures. I'm just saying. <coughs> Um, read a marriage book once a year for those of you who are married. I tell you, it helps because you just go through stages and there are things that come up and you go, how do I handle that? Or, oops, I didn't handle that very well. But reading a marriage book, a Christian marriage book, just helps keep your marriage on track. And same with ch um, reading children rearing kind of books. I tell you, that they go from like this to like that. Oh. Yes, yeah, so most minor kids are all up like that. In a blink of an eye, every year things are changing. Every year I'm thinking, right, got this sussed. But actually I don't, because, oh, where did that attitude come from? And why didn't I nip that when it was down there, and now I've got a great big attitude issue? So it, reading childbearing um, books really, really helps. And even for grandparents that can be helpful, because you can help your children with... Um, rearing their children. Not that you're going to tell them what to do, but you're going to help them. <laughs> Companion planting. Surrounding ourselves with beneficial plants. And in this case, God's fantastic plan was that he would put us in a body of Christ. He would put us in a family surrounding us with beneficial plants, with beneficial people around us. We can't live or function without one another. This isn't how God's created us to be. He's created us to be part of a community of God. And they're to help us, encourage us, smack us on the hand when we need it. They walk alongside us. They pray for us. So get to know those other body parts in the Bible, in your church. Get to know them. Get to know them on a deeper level, not just, hello, hello. How are you? How's your job? How's your week? That's a nice dress you've got on. I'm probably likely to notice earrings. And, but it's got to be deeper than that. God has put us together to know one another spiritually, to help one another. And we cannot do that if we don't know one another. So nurture those relationships. Be beneficial to one another. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is weeding. In Ephesians 5, chapter 9 and 11, it's on page 1162 for those in a pew Bible. Chapter 5, verse 9. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. We are to find those sins. Find out what, God are, what sins are. Because sometimes, like in the respectable sins thing, we think, oh, we're doing okay. But actually, there are little things that are creeping into our lives. Nip them in the bud. The other day, um, David and I... We had a night together, thought we'd watch a movie. Fantastic. And you know what it's like when you're uh, at home and you're flicking through all these movies and you can't decide what to watch. But we decided, well, this looked like an action, Asian action thing. We'll just watch this. It's um, a bit of fun. Well, actually, it got violent. More and more violent. I said, David, just turn this off. I cannot watch this. So it's nipping those things in the, in the bud rather than going, oh, we've got to see how it ends. Or... Oh, well, I'll see the sequel. Oh, actually, there's another sequel. Before you know it, you're in full-blown, oh, well, I'll just watch violent movies because that's what I like. Well, actually, I don't like them, but... Um, nip those things in the bud. Reading it, if you're reading a novel and it gets a bit racy, put it down. You don't have to read that stuff. If you're on the internet and something comes up that's not pure and good and trustworthy and perfect and all those things that I get mixed up in that verse in Philippians... Hey, Elaine, it's hard to remember. <laughs> um, nip th don't look at them. Turn it off. Go, walk away. Um, anger that might be bubbling up inside us. 
Walk away, take a deep breath before the kids or the husband or the dog gets it. Walk away, nip it in the bud. Don't let it fester and grow. In Colossians chapter three, and in Galatians, I'm not going to read them now because we're going to run out of time, but God tells us what is sin. And at the end of Galatians chapter 5, he has a little, there's a little phrase here that says, and things like these. So you can go, oh, well, I'm not sexually immoral, and I don't have evil desires, and I'm not angry or obscene talk, but there are other things and things like these that is a catch-all for the things that are not good, not pure, not right, that God wants you to nip in the bud. Now, the last thing we were talking about is pruning. Now, the word uh, for discipline in the Bible is actually comes from the root word to disciple. God is discipling us as he prunes us. So let's go back to John. You probably want to keep your finger in John, actually, because we'll be going backwards and forwards. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. In Hebrews chapter 12, he puts it like this. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful, peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We need pruning to produce good and more abundant fruit of righteousness. So let's look at different kinds of pruning. We've got small pruning. So the next one. This is my tomatoes. I told you they were terrible. Uh, I had been away for a month, and my tomatoes just had gone like triffids. They'd gone blah, and they'd grown everywhere. So I've hacked them back, and they're really starting to produce tomatoes, quite a lot of them. And as we, that's just a small prune. So sometimes in our lives, God does small things for us, just prunes away different aspects of our character to make it more and more like Christ. And sometimes it has to be heavy duty. Go to the next one. This is my other part of the garden. I, you can't see it very clearly, but that is convolvulus. I've got rhubarb plants at the front, convolvulus at the back, and a grapevine at the, on the left. Underneath that convolvulus is a cucumber plant, a whole lot of chilies, and the top part is actually corn. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's what happens when you leave it for a month. This is what happens when we leave sin for a long time. It becomes so entangled. And don't you just love convolvulus? Because it goes around and around. It entangles. And the only way I'm going to get that corn off out, I'm going to actually pluck the cobs off, and just rip the whole lot out because there is nothing I can do with that now. And so it is sometimes with our lives. If we have sin that entangles, is so entangled with it, in us, it needs to be, it's a big prune. For example, if you start chatting to a guy at work or somewhere you've met in a group, and he's friendly and he's smiling, he always seems pleased to meet, see you. And at home, you've got this grumpy, distant, difficult husband. But here you have this lovely guy who just seems really happy to see you. And before long, a physical relationship happens, and you are entangled. But you can't hide that. You cannot hide any big sin in your life. And eventually, God intervenes. You found out. Either, however that will be. Um, either you cannot carry that burden anymore or someone sees you with this guy and, this, and God will and 
is willing to forgive you if you repent. If you say, oh, I'm not going to have anything to, more to do with this guy, I'm going to cut him off, cut him off all social media, everything, I'm not going to see him anymore. He will forgive you. There will be um, consequences, probably, for your actions. The trust that your husband has with, for you is going to take a long time to build up. That your children are going to find it difficult to trust you again, too, for a long time. But it's for your good, for your spiritual good, to get rid of that sin that entangles you. The other sin, or the other type of sin, is it's not always your sin. It's someone else's sin on your life that God is using to prune you and to discipline you. Um, last year, I had something come across my path that absolutely broadsided me. I was just absolutely flabbergasted. I was, um, it was terrible. And I was reading through my devotions, reading through my Bible, and I, came, and I was reading through Hebrews, and I came to that verse in, in um, chapter 12. And it said, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness who, by those who have trained right. I hadn't thought of that this particular instant of someone else's sin would be discipline for me. But I have learned that God is good and that he will produce fruit in me as I walk with him. What does that fruit look like? I don't know yet. Patience, definitely. Self-control, I definitely wanted to smash someone in the face, so I'm not going to do that. Um, gentleness, kindness, forgiveness, all these fruit are beginning to be born because of someone else's sin. So don't blame someone else because you're sinning. Don't blame someone else because you're ungodly. God is using this situation, whatever that is, for your good to produce fruit of righteousness in your life. Now, it might be a health scare. You might be really in a really just a really busy time. It might be a needy relative that is just taking up so much of your time, or it might be all of the above, all at once. God is discipling us to be more and more like him, to bear the fruit of righteousness so that we can be, so that we can give glory to him and that others can see that glory. Um, I was talking to a widow recently and she'd just had a huge pruning. She'd lost her husband. And yet she said to me, we were talking about my, she knew my talk was coming up and we were talking about it. And, we're, and she said, you know, I know this is a heavy pruning for me, but I know that God is good. I know that he has a good plan for me. I'm going to miss my husband terribly, she said. But... She wanted to bear the good fruit of righteousness, to, to give glory to her. She still had, God still had a plan for her life, even though now she had no husband anymore to look, walk that walk with her. Um, I was really, really encouraged by that, that even at such a severe circumstance, that someone could see that God is still good. So we are called to grow beyond a basic faith. We are to grow abundant fruit. Thanks, Jess. In the second session, this afternoon, um, later, um, we're going to look at what the fruit is, what does it look like. Um, you all know what the fruit of the Spirit is, love, joy, peace, etc. And we're going to go into that in more detail. But now... I want you to think about abiding in Christ, spending time with him, spending, being watered and fed by him, thinking about pruning and weeding and how those are good things for you so that you may grow in Christ, so that you may spend time with Jesus to become more and more like him. Um, as we are in a relationship, the more time we spend with someone, 
the more we become like him. I've been together now with David for 30 years, and I, sometimes I think I'm more like him than he is. <laughs> Especially when I want to smash someone in the face. Oh, no. <laughs> and so it is with our relationship with Christ. The more we spend time with him, the more we spend time in the word, praying, with, praying to him, listening to the preaching of the word, and being filled with the Holy Spirit and working with the Holy Spirit to produce more fruit. We will become more and more like him. This last week has been incredibly busy for me and I have, I have been living this talk. I feel like sometimes a bit like Moses whose face is shining out from the mountain. I feel that I'm just topped up with the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. I recommend, do this everybody. Prepare a talk for people Spend time in the Word, it's great, it really is. Um, the slide, just, I just want to finish with Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are such an awesome God and that you have brought all things together <clears throat> for your good, that you have a plan for each one of us, that you want us to live more and more for you, to be more and more abiding in Christ. Lord, we pray that you'd help each one of us to abide in you, to dwell in you, to just be deeply watered by you and fed by you. Help us to appreciate the weeding and pruning that goes on because you love us. Lord, we pray that you'd help each one of us to be more like Jesus Christ and to give glory to you in all that we do and all that we say. We pray that you'd help each one of us to love you more and to love one another more. And as we have morning tea, we pray that you'd help us to deepen the relationships we have with one another, that we may share you with each other. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.